All right, right there, welcome, welcome everybody. everybody. My name's name Scott, Scott Myers. We're drawing together with artists this network where we meet every Wednesday at 3 p.m. Eastern to draw together. together. So, so if you're new, you're new to the show, show what you're going to want to know is that this is all about us challenging ourselves with specific projects designed to help us grow in particular ways. So today, so today we're going to be working, working on a master copy of uh, Michelangelo, Michelangelo drawing, really trying to use the process of creating, creating a master copy to better understand the motivation, the, the decisions, decisions, the technique, the approach, the approach to drawing to that Michelangelo may have incorporated. And we're trying to decode the marks uh, in, in a Michelangelo drawing to better understand, understand where that is coming, coming from. from. So, so um, um, again, if you're new, new this, this is, is all about, about us drawing, drawing together. together. If you'd, if you'd like, like to follow, follow along, uh, feel, feel free. We'd, we'd love, love to have you join us. If you're, if you're using a completely different media, media that's totally fine, too. We're, We're simply, simply trying to take time, time out of our busy lives, lives to draw. draw. So, so um, you'll, you'll find, find a link to the reference image in the description, description below. below. Um, oh, am oh, I, am I, I pe oh, I'm echoing. That is because... There, did that fix it? I hope that fixed it. Sorry, hopefully this is better. I apologize. We could take that from the top, hopefully. Um, welcome. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll kind of pick this back up from the top. So if, I'm just kind of waiting for the chat to hopefully indicate that it is improved. Okay, good. All right, so again, you probably didn't hear anything that I just said. So this is all about us drawing together. If you want to follow along, you can find the reference image in the description below. This, uh, the image that we'll be working from, I got from Wikimedia Commons, so it's in the public domain. So if there are any other technical issues, feel free to shout out, let me know. Um, the, uh, if, you, if you do have any questions, comments, observations, concerns, whatever, that's what the chat is for. So if you have any que uh, special questions for me, you can type them out in all caps, and I am more likely to see them. Um, otherwise, chat amongst yourselves. I'd love to see your approach to drawing, um, hear how your observations, uh, your thoughts about the drawing process may vary from mine. And especially as we try to decode uh, Michelangelo's work, um, where do you, where might you push back on some of the things that I'm observing? What kind of counter observations can you provide, um, et cetera? That's why we're drawing together, and is, this isn't just about me drawing and you watching the whole time. So um, we have a lot of familiar faces. Um, so awesome to see you all here. Um, let's get to it. Okay, I'm going to switch the screen here. Get back to the overhead. Uh, where you'll see the reference image that's right below me on the screen. Um, again, that's the one you can find in the description below. This is my preparatory drawing, so I like to take some time to think through the drawing a little bit so I can articulate uh, things a little bit more clearly because um, it is a little bit of a challenge to draw and talk at the same time. So this is a sheet of just a cotton rag paper. I don't know which one it is because I just grabbed it from my scrap pile, but it feels like a Rives BFK. Um, I'm keeping the, the uh, materials simple um, as I anticipate uh, Michelangelo would have done. What I have are three graphite pencils. I have the, the H and a B that, are, that I have together. Those are very close to one another in, in the scale. I don't typically really differentiate between the, the, the single, single or the kind of double steps in a set of graphite pencils. You know, so I look for the ranges. These, the H and the B are kind of in the middle range of, in terms of hardness. So you'll go up the H scale for harder um, graphite pencils. You go up the B scale for softer pencils. Um, and so when I'm, rather than looking necessarily at the specific ones, I'm trying to grab something from the, the general range. Um, so I have an H and a B together because they're close to one another. Um, and I, I have them so that I have two sharpened pencils. It's one of the things I learned in this preparatory sketch is that there's a delicacy to the line work in Michelangelo's work that um, really is beneficial. It's beneficial to have a sharpened pencil. I don't say that a whole lot in this show, um, but as you see, I, I sharpen my pencils. I use a razor blade to kind of carve this down so I have a nice long exposed core. And then I do have a 2B pencil, which is just, just a couple steps darker in case I need some additional range. So this is very narrow. If all you have is a yellow number two pencil, that will give you, I think, plenty for what you need for this drawing. So um, this isn't about having a full value range 
this drawing here is really all about understanding the human form. Uh, so we'll try to explore that um, as much as we can. So, all right. So it sounds like um, it sounds like the echo has improved. But if anybody else is experiencing any trouble, please just let me know. So, okay. Um, this piece of paper here, I have cut down to ten by twelve. The original is actually 10 by 12 and a half, so I kind of cut off a little bit on the right-hand side um, just because it allows me to get a little bit closer on the shot. Um, so if you have something at about, at about a 10 by 12, uh, that's going to keep your marks consistent with the size of the original drawing. And I think that can be really helpful if you're blowing this up or if you're shrinking this down. It can have a big impact on your approach to the mark making. So um, I'm going to simply start drawing... Uh, I'm going to use the, the B pencil here. What I can observe in the reference image, uh, so I have the small one below me and I have a larger one up here. What I can observe is that in the general process, we can see light, loose marks, a very gestural quality to um, what appear to be the initial layout of the figure. And then Michelangelo is spending more time refining select areas. and understanding which areas he's choosing to refine further gives us insight into what he's really trying to study. This is a study for a marble statue, uh, the Pietà, which, you know, one of one of his, you know, most recognized works. So um, I'm going to start by kind of just reacting in that loose way. And you're not going to see a whole lot on the page Um, and, I, and in some way, I'm going to try to refer to his marks, but I'm not actually all that concerned with getting these marks right. What's going to happen as we go through this is the, um, the, the these early marks, everything's going to get really kind of smudged down and get lost. So it might be helpful to kind of stay in this gestural mode for a while, and it'll help you to... Um, really familiarize yourself with the subject um, and, and knowing that these early marks are really just going to contribute to the underlying tone of the drawing. Uh, and by the, as we kind of come to better understand the particular qualities of this drawing, we'll, we'll be able to really kind of strike that. So I'm not creating any marks that I anticipate as finished at this point. This is really about getting my head in the game and starting to become familiar with the form. And I'm not worried about, I'm not really worried about anything much more than that. Let me see if I can go darker. Yeah, <laughs> it's so light. That's the hard part with these graphite pencils. Uh, there was a question about what brand. These are the Cezanne pencils that uh, Jerry's Artorama um, provides. They're, I really like them. It's really nice quality to them. Um, and, uh, and then uh, lollipop strawberry, question about uh, measuring. That will come into to play here. And what I'm going to try to do is to see if there's anything indicative in his marks that give us a sense of how he might have measured, if he would have used comparative measuring or angle sighting, for example. Um, and if you haven't already, uh, you might uh, try to take, uh, you can maybe bookmark the, um, the Degas episode. So we're, this is part of a whole series. I try to do one of these master copies each month uh, as a way to help expand the, the toolbox, as it were, um, and think perhaps a little differently about, uh, about drawing. Uh, and what, you, what we'll see or what we noticed in the Degas drawing is a sense that he would have used something similar to angle sighting, really kind of blocking in the basic angles, and then striking and trying to find the specific curves that convey the three-dimensional quality of that form through a really delicate and sensitive line. Uh, so there is there are a lot of similarities to this Michelangelo drawing, but also a lot of differences, right? So, um, and some of those differences, while apparently subtle in the drawing, um, really kind of show us a lot about 
uh, the different motivations we might observe in the art making process. So uh, I'm going to just try to be a little bit heavier handed than, um, than I'd like to be just so that you can see the drawing a little bit more. Uh, and, and again, this isn't for me about really kind of getting it right. I'm just trying to connect myself to the drawing, just doing some gestural work, and then I'm going to wipe this down and kind of build up a tone. One of the things that's about this drawing is that really beautiful surface, and I don't know really what quality of paper this original would have been on. Uh, so I, you know, I, I don't know, you know, how much that really plays a role in the 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 development of the drawing, whether it just creates this interesting look or if it actually forced um, the technique to evolve in a particular way. But um, so at this point, I'm not really thinking about mimicking Michelangelo's process yet. I'm just uh, I'm just warming up. Um, and you can see there's this other sketch of the hand in the upper right hand corner, another one in the lower left. I'm going to ignore those uh, for today. But I think just the, by the fact that they're on this page gives us an indication of, again, what what is the, the primary compulsion behind this drawing. Um, and, uh, yeah, so we'll talk through kind of basic basic measuring. Now, one of the things that came up in the Degas episode, I think it was the Degas, but we've talked about it before, is the role that anatomy and an anatomical understa understanding of the figure might play in a figure drawing. And I think there's certainly a lot for us to kind of sink our teeth into, our teeth, our teeth into. Um, you know, again, where we see emphasis, where we see a refining of the form, where we see a change in the pace of marks, all of that gives us a, a hint, a glimpse into the mind of Michelangelo. And, and doing the preparatory drawing, it really revealed to me some things that I, I hadn't really considered with Michelangelo. And I'm curious as we as we get into this, what it's doing for you, as, and see if it's something that you can all connect with. Um, and uh, I, I'm kind of it's interesting that I haven't really done a lot of Michelangelo studies. Um, uh, but so it's really it was really great to kind of take some time with it. So again, I'm just gonna kind of wipe this down. It just builds up a tone that it's going to be useful later on. So don't be afraid to, you know, just simply work at this stage. And I think the the more you do that, the the better in the end. It can feel really unproductive that we're just kind of making a mess at this stage. But I find the more that we do, the, the faster we're going to get to a level of finish. Um, so my goal at this point, as I'm thinking gesturally, is to try to react to the form looking back and forth quickly between the reference and the drawing. And when I'm doing that, I'm, you know, as I'm making an observation, when I'm looking up at the reference image, I'm making them, making them very quick, but I'm also very directed in that I kind of know where I want to go and I come right to that point in the reference image. There's a target in mind. Uh, and in that, in that target is constantly shifting. And what that does is it just helps me to kind of react. It's like taking, it's taking multiple snapshots and then piecing it together rather than one long kind of studious glance at the subject and trying to hold all that information on the mind, in the mind at one time. It's about taking one little piece and reacting to it, getting it on the page, moving, taking another bite, reacting to it. We're not taking, you know, we're not taking a hundred little bits of information, trying to hold that and then process it on the page. 
So um, that's that's where I'm at right now. And it's what it's doing for me is that it's it's helping me to kind of maintain a sense of the whole. So as a, for example, as I go along this arm, I'm becoming gradually more aware of that overall angle here. Um, and as I'm when I'm looking at the reference image, I might be targeting this, but doing a quick glance or using some peripheral vision to better understand the relationship between those two sol shoulders. So I'll be looking at this part in the reference, but checking in where is this? Is it higher or lower? And roughly estimating how far apart they might be. Um, and, and if it feels too far, feels too close, then I might react to it. If it, um, if I'm not getting the angle right, then I, I, you know, I can adjust that and react to it as well. So kind of working bilaterally here, working from the left side of the figure to the right. And you can see that in some of the line work where the, the, the parts that really get exciting for me are where we see the adjustments and corrections. That tells us so much about what is the driving force behind these marks here. Um, uh, sorry to hear that, Jane, about the reference. Um, so the link should take you directly to the Wiki, Wikimedia Commons page where you can download the image. And if you bring that up uh, onto your own computer, you might be able to adjust the brightness of it and adjust the contrast in whatever kind of photo editor app that you might have. Yeah, that's, that's one of the challenging things. Um, the first thing that I typically do if I encounter a drawing like that is to adjust the brightness and see if that happens, just the brightness on the screen. Um, and that's one of the the differences between, you know, working from a a physical source and one that's from a, a digital screen like we're doing now, um, is that we, you know, is we have it's the light coming towards us. There's a brightness that's associated with it. So hopefully that helps. If anybody else is having trouble with that or knows a better solution, let's see if we can help Jane out there. And that's it's one of the reasons why I, I don't do. I don't work in graphite quite as much as I, as I could, and is that it? It doesn't show up on camera all that well. So, okay. And you can see that I'm using this overhand grip, uh, and I find that it gives me kind of precise lines without them being kind of hard edged. It allows me to float the pencil over the page a bit more. And, and as I'm working on this quick gesture, I'm trying to just simply react to the marks. So much of what this process is about is, um, again, trying to get ourselves into the mind of the artist. And so if we see quick lines, we make them quickly. Um, and if you don't, this is one thing that's nice about this, if you don't feel like you hit that mark, you can just wipe that down and, and try it again. Um, sorry, I get a, got quite a bit of shadow on this side here, I bet. Um, let's, let's see. All right, I'm gonna just do some quick check-ins here with, um, with regard to the pose. Uh, one of the things, again, you can see in the original work, if you look up here along this, um, this stretch of the contour line, you can see a very um, decisive shift along that contour where it looks like it's moved from being a little bit farther out to a little bit farther in. And we see that up along this shoulder as well. We see that as we come down here, we see a faint, um, a a faint kind of, uh, ghost of the original hand. We see it over here as well, or he tried to take multiple stabs at that hand. Um, and so it shows us that correction is an inherent process in the way Michelangelo is working. Uh, and that gives me a little bit of confidence because then I can correct as well, and I can feel like I'm being consistent with Michelangelo. And we see this with Angra, for example. He's got some marks that it looks like he's hitting it right right out of the gate. Like there's no hesitation. There's no 
you know, set up for the marks. You're just doing it. That's not happening here. And that makes me feel great because <laughs> um, I think I need, I need a little bit of um, play in the process here to, to figure this out. All right. So I've got kind of a faint understanding of the hand. Um, I don't have any sort of expression of the individual curves yet. But I want to I kind of better understand where this is relative to the knee, where that hand is relative to the shoulder. If we bring the shoulder down and imagine a plumb line cutting through, where does it uh, where does it intersect some of these other forms? I can look across here, and there's a lot of stability between these shoulders. To me, that the fact that these shoulders are horizontally aligned was a specific decision. I really feel like Michelangelo would have um, put a lot of thought into, you know, you know, either kind of staging the model or, or you know, however arriving at it, making those shoulders, the the two shoulders parallel or horizontal with one another. Um, the shoulder so much originates from the shoulder and from the hips in the pose, but by making this horizontal. It gives us a contrast to emphasize that, that severe arch in the neck and the curves that we're seeing in the form here. There's, you know, if, if I'm imagining, you know, the idea that I'm creating this drawing as a, as preparation for a marble sculpture, and the challenge in carving this in marble is to express the life and substance of the human form, then this drawing is ultimately all about understanding the, well, I, mean, I said the life of the form, but this is, this is the Pieta. So this is, you know, we're looking at uh, the Jesus dead here. Um, but there, again, there's the humanness in this pose um, and trying to express that in, in marble somehow. So um, the other thing is that, that that's key about this form is this, this is about being supported, right? It's about being held. You know, we're not seeing the rest of the statue, but he's trying to understand that. And as I look at this pose, you see that so much leads to this shoulder in particular. The way the figure is kind of slumping into that, it feels like it's lifted. And that might be why he adjusted things up here on the top, bringing things down, is to just push things into that shoulder, bring us all into that one point where everything is rested. And then there's a relaxed, there's just a slumping of the figure onto that supported point. Um, and, you know, there's an emphasis on the musculature that, um, that kind of conveys his strength that contrasts against the, again, the, the slump in the form. The elbows are horizontally oriented as well. So if we look at the notches in the elbows there, um, you can create a horizontal guide that leads through those. Um, and I and I just feel like there's a that was an intentional choice again um, to create that contrast. And when you have that contrast, you're emphasizing that other quality. So by having these two horizontal implied axes, the the gesture and the rest of the body gets amplified. And and this is all again coming from a non kind of historical understanding of Michelangelo. I really know nothing, very little about, um, you know, his, his life and his approach to, to drawing and painting, you know, aside from just kind of broad strokes, you know, delivered in art history classes. And so what I'm looking to do is now, if I look at these hands, they feel wildly off. So if I look at that angle here, for example, that um, this, this arm really needs to, 
drop down a bit more. I'm gonna, I am gonna erase this one because it's a bit more distracting. So if any of you are, you know, in the field of art history or have spent time studying Michelangelo, this is a great time to share your expertise and and correct me <laughs> with anything. And you say, hey, no, it's, that's the thought, but not really. Um, I, this is all really just, again, the, the value of creating a master copy is it allows us to start to think that way. And really what, who, you know, what was the driving force behind these lines? All right, you really see actually that sternum, that that really comes straight down. That's really interesting. So what we see is this axis like this. That's very perpendicular. And then we see this shift in the torso that it's not just a bend, but it's a twist as well. Um, and we really see that. And he's put so much refinement in right in here in the belly and up into the chest. You know, some on the arms, but I don't feel quite the amount of, of love in the arms as I do right in here. And I think part of that is, because I can imagine as a sculptor, the challenge of making and conveying that, that sense of softness in the abdomen, contrasting with the, uh, the rib cage here where, where the bones get closer to the surface, trying to capture that seems like an amazing challenge. And so, um, and it also, it, it just, it, it's literally guttural. <laughs> you know, it, there's something that just feels like, oh my God, there's something very human about that. Um, and he's he's definitely looked at the arms, but I feel like everything is being brought into the core. So um, uh, yeah, let's see if there's any. Oh, <laughs> Matt Momus go, yeah, thinking about the, the Ninja Turtles. So maybe I'll get through all of them as part of this process. Now, uh, next. The next uh, master artist that are, or master copy artist is going to be Van Gogh, um, and and then I need to work out more from there. All right, so all right, I'm just trying to take stock of some of these bigger forms. I'm going to do some quick angle sighting. I feel like I've generally got the correct angles here. There's, this is largely vertical, but it cuts in just a little bit. Um, all right. So now I think I can go in with a bit more, more precision and see where we can go with this. So, now, I've worked in some of these gestures, and the first few times, there was just kind of a rough attempt at mimicking the marks that I'm seeing in the original. Um, but I'm going to be doing that again and again, so I can wipe that down. You know, I've got some of these faint marks, and, and I'm going to try to do that repeatedly. Um, and, you know, in my mind, it's like doing, you know, 20 or 30 master copies, right there, at least with some of those marks. So, um, let's see. So where do I want to go? Where do I want to go from here? Yeah, I think, that, so one of the things that really comes forward to me as I look at this work is, you know, he's definitely someone who understands anatomy. All right, the, but he's not building from any anatomical understanding. All right, so I don't see any evidence of him building an internal armature, almost envisioning the skeleton and then building the muscles and then building you know, the flesh on top of that. Um, but I think within that, he's definitely keenly aware of how the lines convey that information. Um, so, my, my, my guess is that is when we look down in this area, for example, it looks like he's taken just one pass at, at kind of roughing in that form. And he kind of let that sit. 
and then he's bringing all again all the focus in here. And by what that means is that he's what I, I kind of interpret from that, and especially as I look at the hands, where there's a little bit more refinement, uh, moving up to the arms, moving into the head, where there's a bit more refinement, moving down the chest and into the abdomen, where there's even more. What I see in that is a layering effect of you know perhaps kind of now passing through the drawing, building up another layer of of precision in certain areas or maybe over the whole drawing and then working into a smaller area with another layer of precision and refinement, moving into another area of, of additional layers and refinement. Um, and I, I feel like he would have also been moving around the whole drawing at the same time. So not necessarily finishing in one area and then, um, and then moving to the next. So, so that's where I'm going to try to bring everything up all at once. Um, oh, he produced one fake sculpture. That's interesting. Um, and then remember, I think he over-exaggerated his stomach area to create drama and tension, which is a good thing. To, yeah, I think that's exactly it. The, um, you know, there's, I think he's intending for an emotional response. Um, and in that, it's, uh, there's a lot of tension. You know, there's so much of sculpture is about weight distribution. It's what makes his statue of David um, so uh, profound is that contrapposto, that pose that, um, that really exemplifies that, uh, that weight distribution. All right, so as I'm going through, what I, what I see is that it's not, for him, it's not about one continuous line along a contour. That edge is constantly broken up. If you look at this, the shoulder on the right, so uh, the left shoulder, you know, there's, it's almost, when you, when you focus on that one area, it's almost hard to even see which line represents the edge of that contour. When you step back and you see it in context, you don't really question it. You say there's the edge of the shoulder. Um, so that's, that's something that's interesting, and it, which is great because then it allows me to kind of feel out the form a little bit. And I'm going to continue to use this overhand grip as I do that. Um, and that allows me to kind of engage the side of the pencil a bit more. I kind of try to rough in the shapes of the eyes and the nose. And, you know, we've talked about this before, but, you know, the idea of um, really embracing the abstract quality of the subject, whether it's, you know, you're doing a, a master copy or whether you're, you know, working from life, there's an abstract, an, an abstract quality to it that you can try to identify. So what I mean by that is thinking, you know, just what is that line? Uh, what is that, what is that shape, value, where is it located? Um, and and really leading by that because we don't have a figure. I don't know if he was, I mean, imagine he had staged a model and was working from that model. We don't have that in front of us. We have the drawing. Uh, and so, you know, so where he might be thinking shoulder, he might be thinking, you know, deltoid and bicep, you know, we're going to be looking at this kind of abstractly. And then noticing that there's this, this shading here, you know, he's using light and shadow to turn the form and create a sense of volume. It doesn't necessarily feel, um, you know, like he's really focusing on the light. He's using the light to his advantage, but maybe manipulating it. Um, it does feel like a natural light quality rather than anything sort of, sort of stage, which would make sense because, um, artificial light sources were very different than what we have today. So he's not staging this like you might a photograph. You might be kind of confined to natural light 
um, in the space, which is just has its own quality to it. And as I'm looking at this, I'm really becoming aware of how masterful his understanding of contour is. And, and in particular, the, um, the weaving together of concave and convex marks. These are very complicated forms. Um, and he's using line to, to express so much, very similar to, um, to Degas' work. And I'm going to try to talk through that as I get to a greater level of refinement. I'm just looking at this and how much is being conveyed in the line work. Um, but I want to make sure that I'm, in general, kind of like kind of working in the correct area. So if there's a thumb, and again, moving my eyes back and forth very quickly. I may end up, you know, end up striking a lot of these forms multiple times. Um, but I, I think right away what I see, and this is this is kind of right in line with what we see in, in his work. I've drawn this too high, and I need to bring it down. Again, to really push that he's doing that for the service of this shoulder, maybe bring this up a little bit more, make some minor adjustments um, to really just put that weight. It's not like everything is just being held on that shoulder. It's so beautiful. Um, and then there's so much subtlety in the, the muscles there. And what it kind of gets me thinking too is kind of trying to understand how his work with fresco might have impacted a, a his drawing. Because fresco is it's works it's so different. You're painting into wet areas of wet plaster, so you have to really define a specific area and then fill it in. Um, Uh, remember, say the, the left side looks like he went with negative space to render that space between the forearm and the lower hip. Yes, right in here, emphasizing that negative space. Yeah, it could be. Um, Peter Frost will use watercolor more. I don't have any plans to do watercolor, but I, I am considering, um, you know, kind of getting into the, uh, you know, more painting, you know, so doing some drawing, um, but also um, having a painting together show. We have some episodes with Gigi Chen of painting together, but maybe doing some kind of oil painting or pastel work just to vary things up. If anybody, if, if any of you would have an interest in that, I don't know if I'd be able to do both that show and a drawing one. So it might be kind of alternating between uh, drawing and painting. All right, so I'm just trying to get a sense of that overall form, and I'm feeling pretty good about it. Um, I think enough to, you know, enough to just kind of move forward with it. So I'm going to wipe this down again, and Kind of build up the whole page. I just love all that, just how, and just the age on that paper that he's working on. And he can't really achieve that. Um, but there's a, you know, it's, it's turned yellow. It's, it's acidified a bit. Um, so I think I can zoom in just a little bit. That might help. There we go. And brighten up. Okay. And then uh, Rob C.P. Woodturner, question please. Would Michelangelo have used his knowledge of anatomy to draw this, or do you think he had a model in front of him? I, my guess is that he had a model. Um, and having said that, he did, 
he worked so much with the human form. It wouldn't surprise me if he would essentially have, have pulled this out. But uh, just knowing that this was this was in preparation of um, you know one of his his more profound pieces, um, I feel like he would have had a model in front of him. There is just there's just a quality of looking very closely that comes through in these marks that I feel like he, he would have really he would have had somebody here. Um, let's see. Mariana is saying, picturing the figure holding the semi reclined body, the right side is turning into the abdomen. Yeah, exactly. So there's like this. It's not just a kind of curve this way, but this shoulder coming forward, there's a twisting of the hips, um, and it's all, I don't know, it's just, it's beautifully, uh, it's beautifully selected, I guess is the term. Again, you know, part of what we're doing here is trying to understand the decisions um, that Michelangelo would have made. And when I think about sculptures, you know, sometimes you see sculptures that are kind of, they feel rigid and stiff, and that might be an artistic decision, or some where the, where the gesture is over-exaggerated. Um, and so every artist is going to kind of have their own kind of direction in that, in that area. Um, so, and what I feel like Michelangelo is, is so profound at is creating these poses that feel exaggerated but really natural at the same time he's not he's not amplifying it for the sake of the drama he's seeing the drama in what is naturally possible right and so really a beautiful um so oh uh, peter this is so this is a, these are from my set of Cezanne pencils um and i'm using the b graphite right now okay so I need to start thinking about I need to start thinking about kind of the direction of the marks. Um, and I, I think what I want to do is actually I'm going to do a little bit of subtractive drawing. So I'm going to use my kneaded eraser uh, to think through some of the forms here. And this will help me to see the shapes of the, the shadow work a little bit more. And all of this stuff is going to be adjusted, and you know, we're going to continue to adjust. But uh, you know, so as I as I lift off some of these highlighted areas, and then we we st it starts to reveal the shapes in here that I can emphasize further with directional and dimensional hatching and line work. And so that's one of the benefits for toning the page. And I I kind of feel like as a sculptor, um, especially of a subtractive medium like um, like a marble, that this wouldn't necessarily be out of line for a technique or an approach that you would have made. Now, I don't see really any direct evidence of erasing, but I, um, but I, I kind of also, I feel like if I look at some of these highlighted areas that that he was, he was being, uh, he was lifting with an eraser. Uh, and as I'm doing this, I'm trying to think kind of dimensionally as well. So, you know, we haven't talked about kind of contour and cross contour in a little while. Um, so if you, and if or if you're new, you may be wondering what the heck those terms mean. So the contour lines are these kind of outer edge lines that really express the three-dimensional quality of the form. Um, and there's a delicacy to them. There's the way they, they interlock and overlap one another that conveys that three-dimensional quality. The cross-contour marks happen within those contour lines to help give the figure, the drawing, more dimension. So what we see in this drawing is there's, uh, there's many different approaches. There's dim some dimensional hatching where he's really using his hatch marks to follow along the form of the figure. And then he's also using some parallel hatching, which creates kind of a, a, a wash over um, several areas of that form to darken the value. 
and help unify it. it almost creates a light and shadow effect. Um, and so we'll be looking at that a little bit more as we go to, um, it's all very kind of delicate and I'm intentionally kind of moving around so that I don't start fussing. Um, but what you can see now is we start to say lift areas like this, you see the muscles in the forearm starting to form where the highlight comes here. There's, you, there's this muscle here in the forearm that um, starts to pop out and then you've got the ridge of the muscle, we move back along this plane into shadow. Um, there is the side of the, the arm here that gets a little bit harder that he's capturing. Uh, so right now, though, what I'm looking at are areas where the, I can lift off some of those highlights, and that's helping me to understand some of the, the forms here. Now, there's a lot of, uh, I think a lot of anatomy we could get into, but I don't know it. <laughs> I used to. I used to... Um, you know, when I took classes on anatomy for figure drawing, we had to know uh, these major muscle groups in by name. And I have forgotten every bit of that because that was 25 years ago or almost 25 years ago. Um, I'm just trying to observe the shape of these light areas. And again, that's going to help me to um, observe the areas of, of dark as well. And one of the things that really becomes apparent is how, um, how much a role edges play in this drawing. If these transitions are really in, in, important um, for conveying a sense of structure. It's the how, how sharp the transition is from between light and shadow, how soft it is, all of that gives us an understanding of what that might, what the material might be, what the musculature might be. So lots of muscular forms in that form that are showing up there. Um, and again, I'm going to see what we can learn about Learn about that as we get into it further. But I think back to that, that question about whether he was working from a live model or, or some sort of internal understanding of the of anatomy. Um, yeah, I don't get a sense that these marks were practiced, that it's a, that he's executing on a, a series of practice marks that he created over, you know, he's kind of mastered over time. So yeah, so look at, look at this forearm where you get, um, you get that bit of muscle that wraps over the elbow. You get this large muscle form this smaller one that seems to wrap up and over, we get the wrist starting to emerge out from between them. It's amazing. Okay. Kind of lifting off some of this area down in here. I don't think that's anything that he would have done per se, but all right. Uh, Lynn D having trouble with proportions in the arm and forearm. Okay, let's we'll see if we can kind of work on that a little bit. I think I'm going to try to essentially move from left to right here, um, and then kind of back, kind of back and forth from there. Um, Oh, I love what you're saying that, Rob, about the, the proportions of David because it was designed to be in situ on top of the building. Um, and then Mariana, love those comments there. Maybe the leg pelvis weight is pulling the abdomen from the ribs. Trying to envision the figure under the body really helps me. Oh, good, good. Yeah, I think that's, um, yeah, I think that is something that, um, 
yeah, let's we'll kind of get into that. Let's see. I'm gonna I'm gonna start working on this arm here. What do I see here? I'm gonna I see in this I see in this background. This is this is uh, this hatching is where I really. I really, one of the things that was that really stood out for me when I did my preparatory drawing is how masterful both Degas and Michelangelo are at hatching and how much I need to practice. <laughs> and I think you think of it as a simple basic skill, but I, I mean I look at I look at these marks that he made and there's you know it, I don't get a sense that he's intending them to be evenly spaced, there's a relaxed quality to it. But as I make these marks, I'm all over the place. I've got the, the spacing, the pressure, nothing is consistent. <laughs> and I'm like, dang, wow, this guy really gives me something to think about. And you can see what, but you can see this kind of radiating quality in those marks in that, in that background there. Um, we see that here as well as he's building up the values a sense that he would have done something uh, technique just like what I did here, um, but he just has just has a confidence and a mastery that comes from just practice. Like you could tell, he's done this so many times. And the thing is, I do so little hatching. This is making me it's become painfully aware of my limitations. So. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, this is why we practice and we do these master copies. Um, and, and hopefully if that's something that you find as well, that it's not too big of a deal for you. Uh, now, I want to point out something really small, but I think that can be profound. If you look in this area, for example, especially right in here, we look at this dark line and that dark line seems broken what you what I start to notice is a layer of hatching underneath like that. And what that does is it creates these subtle embossed lines. So when he comes in on top of this with a bit of a, a mark that kind of floats on the surface, it's breaking up that edge. Um, if you were to zoom in on just this one area right in here, for example, it would it, it feels from a distance that there's some precision and control. And I think I mean there is some control there, but there's also the texture that comes about from building up multiple layers of marks with a hard material like graphite. And so you can see in here, I could start to see a a wash of value that works its way down into the forearm, that merges the shadow and the turn of this forearm here into the, the dark spot, spot here. Um, and then because that, again, that, that broken quality of the line, it could be an artistic choice, it could be a technical choice that he's doing on purpose, or, you know, but intentionally breaking up that line, or it could just be naturally breaking because of the way these uh, various techniques overlap with one another, if that makes sense. Hopefully that, hopefully that makes sense. Um, uh, Jane Alexander is asking if I'm familiar with the anatom the the medical illustrations of Frank Netter. I do believe so. I can't confirm. I used to look at anatomical illustrations a lot more, but. I need to double check that. Um, I, I think anatomical illustration is an amazing art form. And, um, and my good friends, in, when we were in art school, all he would do is study Michelangelo. Not all he would do, but he would spend a lot of time studying Michelangelo. Um, it would, uh, and he thought about becoming a medical illustrator at some point. Um, what, a, what an amazing skill. Um, okay. So, and as we're looking at the, at the form, one of the things we're going to see throughout this entire body is the turning of the form through the contrast between light and dark. And I observe two main um, thoughts about hatch marks to help reinforce that form. Uh, there's 
the parallel hatching or the hatching that runs parallel to the form. Um, you know, and I see like here there's, I'm going to do this patch again. Letting these marks go right over that edge because as I follow along this edge, I see some of those marks apparently broken by the, um, broken by the hatch marks there. Now, actually what I'm, I've built up so much, so much value. I'm just going to lift that again and see if I can strike that again. So now we've, we've done a practice, <laughs> practice run. And we'll try that again. Um, you know, as we, so as we follow along here, you see he's feeling out the, the form there. And to get back to the, the two dimensions of hatching, we start to see a, an understanding or a sense that what he's doing is he's creating these parallel hatches that get closer together into that edge and open up as we move to the center of that form. And they're following kind of parallel to that outer um, contour line. And we see that in here, moving from that darker line here, getting close together, kind of gradually opening up. And then that spacing creates a transition into dark. Uh, but then there's also a change in direction where you get some cross hatching, where some of these marks might run um, at, a, at a different angle to the first row of parallel hatching. And that helps to add dimension as well. So try to, if you, and if you can see the specific direction of the marks that he's making, that's awesome. It's a challenge for me, I can't quite get in close enough currently. Uh, and then, you know, where we get kind of a more complex form, you just get more um, kind of an overlapping of more cross hatching. Move into that clavicle there. Um, and there, so that what just strikes me is the you know, the, the play in the lines here or along those edges, those contour lines aren't as kind of precise as I imagined at first. Um, um, Alden Walker has got to be careful with those comments. Um, The, let's see. Oh, <laughs> I'm so, so anybody, any art historians out there, Mad Mo Must Go mentioned cartoons. And I was just talking about this. And I need to double check this because I could be entirely wrong. But my understanding of the word cartoon is that it, it is derived or was originally used in the context of fresco drawing. So this, or fresco painting, I'm sorry. So, uh, and as Michelangelo was, you know, famously adept at, um, and my understanding of the cartoon was that you he would create the the kind of the full scale drawings, and then transfer that to a sheet of paper, transfer the line work to a sheet of paper that would then be pressed up onto the wall. Um, and the way you would transfer that mark is poke holes along that line, pinholes along that line, and you, you pounce it with a, a cheesecloth with charcoal powder. So where you're, you're holding the drawing up there and where you're pouncing over the drawing, that charcoal dust is transferring it through these tiny holes onto the, the plaster. You pull that away and you have a, basically a connect the dots that allows you to see the outline that you could then kind of fill in with specific areas. Uh, fill in those specific areas with the um, uh, with the the plaster. So you just work one area at a time. 
And what I seem to under remember is that that drawing used to transfer to the wall was called a cartoon. So, um, and I, I don't know that for sure, and I need to double check that if anybody knows and can, can clarify, that would be fantastic. All right, Alden, you are free to have your points. Um, we just don't have want to make observations that will offend anybody. Because we are here to draw together. Let's see. So as I'm as I'm coming down here, so as you're looking at this arm, you know, really observe the the um, the delicacy of these marks as we go through. So some areas like right in here where it feels like the line work gets a little bit kind of more crisp, we break up some of those marks as we come down that form. And then there's this, this overlapping where we have these two forms that intersect at that angle. That's really critical for conveying that, that quality of the muscle there. And as we come down here, we see the tricep. We come in there and we see another just slight bump in this line that conveys that muscle just below the tricep, <laughs> tendon-ish, whatever that is, and into the forearm, I mean, into the, the elbow, and where we have this muscle coming in on top, this muscle here attaching to the elbow. Um, as we come down in here, we see this other kind of bulge. As we move down in here, we transition from the muscle on the forearm into the wrist that where the bone gets closer to the surface. And as we look over here, so pay attention really to what we observe in this muscle here. We have this muscle here. It, uh, it kind of attaches to the elbow comes in up over the, the bone on the forearm and then kind of tucks in where there's now another muscle that kind of comes in on top of that muscle. And so if you look at the contour line, we see a transition from this muscular shape to then this muscle that's coming in on top. Now it kind of takes over that, um, that contour. And then, we, then that muscle ends and now we see the kind of the bonier part of that wrist taking over that contour. Um, that is mastery in terms of contour. Um, let's see. Oh, no worry, Alden. Um, let's see, uh, Gail, from the Art Historians, I've been listening to you. You're correct about the cartoons. Awesome. <laughs> um, Oh, and then Rob said you got different answers, so this is kind of cool. See where that comes up from. And then Alden, you're saying, my art teacher said to never use black as shadow. You should use a muted or highlighted tone of the color you want the shadow cre uh, cast on, but never use raw black. When you're painting, um, that is often the case. That Generally, I don't use um, a pure black. You know, in drawing, of course, it's a little different. Um, but having said that, there are some really, there's been some great drawings, uh, great paintings out there where people have used black straight from the tube. Because the, the truth is, all color is specific. And generally, you're, you're told to avoid colors paint from the, from the tube because it's not specific. But the key factor is that color is also a relationship. So by, being, by create, putting a non-specific color next to a specific color, you run the risk of, of creating a, an imperfect balance between those two colors. But sometimes you can make the black from a tube work simply by choosing the right color to put it adjacent to, if that makes sense. And so I just try to av uh, avoid um, the kind of absolute terms because I, I think there, there can be value in really understanding it 
uh, from your own perspective about what works and doesn't work for you. But it, it, what we can say about using black in the shadows when you're painting is that it's it's something that can be particularly dangerous and you want to um, go into using it mindfully, if that makes sense. Okay, so very thin shadow here on that forearm. Um, and as I'm, I'm intentionally using these vertical marks because I contrast these marks here, which are more horizontal. And just that contrast, even if it's subtle, will, um, will help to create that turning form that we're looking for and that he seems to be really um, observant of. We see this subtle shadow here Uh, on the wrist, very light form here. And then there's really kind of a darkening in this area to help kind of create that, that overlapping of those muscles. Um, yes, Liz has got a question, uh, wait. I missed, I, <laughs> I lost a, um, I lost a, an observation. Let's see. Oh, Dita, no, you're making a comment about the placement of the elbow. Yeah, I do feel like this elbow should be lifted up a bit more and put a little bit more bend in it. Um, let me, uh, But I'm gonna I'm gonna stick with it for now, just so we keep moving along, because we're already an hour in, and I want to make sure that uh, we're addressing all the areas, even if they're imperfect. Um, okay, so now we're this this shadow here. Uh, it really helps to create that separation between the bicep and the tricep and the deltoid. Um, and there's there is a sense that it's it's really hard to tell if he would have smudged much, but I, I I feel like he is in some of these areas. Some areas the the hatching is clearer than others. Uh, and one of the things that I really like seeing is this subtle thing right here, this little dip to black there that creates that pit into that the collarbone. Beautiful. Let me come up here and kind of darken that a little bit. I'm gonna try to get the, the face in there. There's hatching, just to kind of build up some shadow there. Um, you see he's very quickly establishing this curve here for the jaw. But when I look, when I look at the facial features, you know, again, if you were just to isolate that, what a weird abstraction of marks. Um, but when you put it all together, there's an understanding of the the eyes, the nose, and the mouth. You know, you see you see these kind of circular marks here, where he's trying to feel out the the eye socket very lightly. He's trying to feel out the, the forehead and the hair. And he's feeling out this eye socket too. So he's aware of that plane of the forehead and then, then the kind of the roll of the cheekbones there. That's it's just too heavy. I need to. We look at the the nose. I don't even know what he's reacting to there. That's wild that he makes it look like the nose. And then the mouth, 
He's paying particular attention to the corners and then that curve. So it's not, he's not drawing one line for the mouth or just a couple lines, he's drawing multiple. Yikes, okay. That is amazingly delicate. So what you saw me do there is I just kind of tapped it out and I wanted to um, take another stab at this. Because it was, those marks were just distracting, too heavy. Uh, that's my problem right there. I'm not paying attention to the relationship between the shoulder and the mouth. Okay. Um, Alden is saying, I like drawing anatomy, but the wrist portion to the finger is always tricky. I hate hands. <laughs> you know, it's kind of like a bunch of bananas. That's right. I heard drawing hands and feet are the most challenging part of drawing. Potentially. Uh, that's a really good topic. So I want to get through some of these comments and then I'm going to, I'm going to try to address that. Um, Alden's been experimenting with charcoal powder and paintbrush. Oh, awesome. Yeah, that's a really great technique. Um, let's see. We have, there is an episode that I did on drawing a hand that's more, more of a finished hand. Um, and what you see here is a gestural quality. Um, I, I, I might come back to that. I think that would be a really good topic is to focus on hands and maybe a variety of ways of, of drawing them. Because you'll see different approaches. Some people just ignore them altogether, or they'll strategically crop the hands so you don't have to you don't have to work on them. Um, but uh, oh, yeah, Mariana saying, doesn't this remind you of the assassination of Marah by David? Um, yes, there is the draping of the arms. Absolutely. If you don't know that. Uh, look at that, that Marat painting by, by Jacques-Louis David. Um, yeah, black and white are interesting. So other comments that I'm seeing coming on black and white. Um, we calibrate to that, right? And so our eyes are always adjusting to the intensity of light and shadow. So they're, by all intents and purposes, areas of black and white, but there's also degrees of that. Um, there are, you know, different black pigments, for example. Um, some will get darker than others. You know, what is it? Vanta black is the darkest black, or I think there's an even darker one now um, that's made in paint, and it almost feels like there's an absence in space. Um, but there are degrees in that, and, and when painting... The challenge in black and white is, is not necessarily their value, it's their, it's, they're essentially colorless. Um, white light, for example, is the combination of all frequency of, frequencies of light that we're able to perceive. They combine together to create white light. Um, you know, shadows are very dark and the darkest place, the absence of light is, is black. Um, but in the context of a drawing, or I mean, I'm sorry, a painting, um, the when you look at the saturation scale, right, of and and a, a tint or a shade scale, you go from black to to you know through the color into white. So a tint is a color in which you're adding white. A shade is or, uh, is a color in which you're adding black. You're darkening it. A tone is a color in which you're maintaining that value, but you're reducing the saturation. Um, and you're your ability to control all three of those qualities, hue, value, and saturation, is what really controls your color in painting. Um, and so mixing pure black in with your colors can be a little dangerous because it's a less nuanced understanding of color. And you might want to shift warm and cool temperatures in your painting or um, or in kind of or unify them through a common a common um, sense of color temperature by adjusting your your darks and adjusting your lights. 
So um, that's, that's really the way I, I conceive of the challenge of working with white and black. All right, so I'm just going to continue to work through these areas here. You know, so we see some here along in here, some turning of the form marks, very light, um, but again, parallel-ish to the contour. I kind of got, oh, the hands, the hands. Um, yeah, hands definitely are complex forms. They are managed in a variety of ways by artists. You know, some are, they, they just keep it gestural and try to suggest the hands. And this is what we see in Michelangelo's work. So for example, he hasn't really rendered every finger. He's just kind of, he's indicated where the hands should be and give enough, enough of an indication so that we don't really question it. Um, uh, then you look at somebody like Sargent, um, who he focuses again on the gesture of the hand, but gives it a little bit more information. Um, and then you look at somebody like Angra, who um, really focuses on the contour of the hands. Uh, but there's just a, a level of precision that is astounding. Just, gosh, these, it's just the delicacy along this line blows my mind. Okay, so I'm building up some hatch marks here. So, uh, but in terms of that, generally where I, I see hands kind of fall apart is in, I guess ultimately what it comes down to is confidence and that we can see in the work. Sometimes what will happen is we'll overdo it. Um, and we get pulled to areas of, of in a painting or a drawing that feel either overworked or perhaps less confidently executed than other areas. And then it, it has this kind of backfiring effect. Um, if, and so I, I think, I don't, I don't know if I really have any suggestions without seeing specific work but um, rather than try to hammer away at your drawing and keep adding more, keep adding more to it, perhaps think about a strategy in which you, you kind of, you work on the hand, you try to draw the hand, but then if you're not liking it, wipe it down, try it again more efficiently. Wipe it down, try it again more efficiently still. Um, rather than, again, trying to continually hammer away at that one drawing and try to make it work, try to force it into submission, as it were, um, because then it, it can take on a, a clumsiness. And um, the gesture of the hands is, is just something that we often just take in as body language when we're confronted with another human. You know, we are, we're, we're kind of primed to observe facial expression and body language. And we're looking for the movement of the hands in general, not, you know, and generally they're moving around so much that we can't really lock onto them. Um, so we, I think we often um, perhaps emphasize them more than they need to be emphasized for the sake of visual communication with their audience. Um, so as you look at this, this is just a, a really beautiful section. Okay, so the, the tension in this neck is really amplified by this muscle here. So the contour of this neck is, becomes a muscle that, content, that extends down into the center of the form where it, it starts to transition into the hollow there by the, by the, the collarbone. Then emerging from behind it, we see this kind of thin bump here. Then we see the larger, mus larger muscular form here, which then kind of tucks into that bone where the collarbone then now kind of extends up 
into the surface here where we see this, that bony bump, <laughs> whatever that's called. Uh, I wish I knew what that uh, was. But so if you can think about that contour, again, as in that's where that interior of the form meets that edge. And so if you think about it as a relationship between the external edge and the interior form, that's how you can start to add more uh, specificity to your contour line work. Hopefully that makes sense. Uh, and just a, a lot of complexity. As we work into this area, we have multiple planes all merging together. Um, where, you know, we have the plane of the, the chest muscles, which actually have, are broken into multiple planes. We have this wrapping around, this cylindrical kind of pull around the collarbone into the shoulder, which then projects forward a little bit. And then we have another kind of plane. So there's just a lot happening there. Um, and I'm going to, I want to kind of keep now looking at the sternum here where you see the chest muscles attaching to the ribs. So be careful along in here to observe the specific spacing, the pacing of those darker areas. And you can see uh, a, a general kind of horizontal um, direction into his hatch marks here. Very, again, very subtle. Um, you, and you see the, a real, real understanding of this, the specificity of what happens there along the rib cage in the front of the sternum, where the muscles kind of tighten up here in the front, they kind of they, they become more kind of spaced out here. They open up a little bit more on the, the outer edges there. Um, and with these hatch marks, if you're having trouble with them, um, you know, think about them kind of like a scooping mark. There's a, there's a gentleness to the way they're landing and lifting off the page. And I, cre I pulled that shadow down too far. There's a muscle right under here and I can lift out with my eraser, soften that if I need to. And then the, you know, we can tap with the eraser to pull out highlights in those, those muscles as well. Um, Oh, Drawing Dynamic Hands, that's a good book, yeah. Um, uh, Chuck P is asking, what medium is the original Michelangelo drawing? I believe it's graphite, but I don't really know for sure. Uh, who is it? Uh, yeah, Rob, you're saying that it could be silver point, and it could be. That would account for some of the, uh, the embossing of the hatch marks that seem to be impacting the line work. Um, and that's all. And also, even within brands in our modern graphite pencil, there can be a lot of variety. With these Cezanne pencil, they tend they're just a kind of smoother, and they may be different than if you're using like a Stadler or a Derwent or something like that. Um, so we we kind of do the best we can to try to match it, but um, you know, I don't know if there's much that we can really do at some point. So the kind of back to the, the topic of anatomy and the benefit of having an anatomical understanding that, you know, the, the more you can really understand the human anatomy, the, I think the, the more informed your drawings will become. You know, having said that, and I've mentioned this before, it shouldn't necessarily hold you back from, from drawing. Um, you can still rely on what you do know about the drawing process, you know, line, shape, value, and form. 
And if, even if you just think about them on those terms, it can get you a fair amount of the way. So for example, as I'm lifting off this light, light area here, I can think about it on the terms of a kind of an abstraction. You know, what is that shape? What is that general value and how do they fit together? And then think backwards into the anatomy and say, well, what does that tell me about the anatomy if I'm observing these shapes and how they relate to one another? And often what you know studying does is it just makes you aware of certain aspects of the human form that you may not have been aware of before. And you know, really so much of our artistic understanding is, is built around deciding what's important and what's not. You know, and if we tell our brains that something is important, we'll notice it more. Um, you know, we're capable of seeing far more than we notice. We just don't, we're just not aware of it. There's a difference between perception and awareness. And having an anatomical understanding of the human form can help you build an awareness that can be really helpful. Um, but again, I don't, I don't know if it's helpful to let that hold you up from uh, from your drawing if you don't have that. All right, so look at this, like right in here, this beautifully subtle transition in value where we move across the chest into shadow, but then that shadow is broken slightly um, as we you know, observe that specific quality of the chest muscle. Um, He mostly used, Gail is saying, mostly black chalk and charcoal and sometimes red chalk. Yeah, this one definitely doesn't feel like charcoal to me. It feels like graphite. Um, but again, it could be a totally different form. But um, silver point is a really wild medium that I've done very little work with. Um, but it's... It, it's a bit kind of what you imagine you'd expect uh, from a medium that's called silver, silver point. You're essentially drawing with a nail. That's what it feels like, which you can, which you can do. You know, it's just a very hard one and a hard material. Um, what, I, what I feel like is I need to bring this out. Bring this chest muscle over. I've kind of collapsed his chest too much. So I'm going to try to fix that. Definitely. So I'm going to go like this, kind of parallel hatching, kind of transitioning from heavier to lighter. All right, just thinking a little bit more, so I'm talking less. Um, hopefully, you know, if we, I don't know how far we'll get with this drawing, but I'm hoping we'll get through it um, in time. And if not, hopefully then it's enough to kind of give you something to chew on a bit. Let me see here. I don't. Just gotta place that armpit better. Kind of fumbling my way through that. And what we see here, we see evidence of a value wash. And really running down that whole arm, kind of lifts off some of it here along that bicep. Uh, and you can you can make out kind of some. Actually, I'm going to switch. I'm going to switch to the 
Oh, it's a 2B. I'm going to switch to the H pencil. Um, and what I'll do is try to zoom in a little bit more so you can kind of see that, you know, I just, when I look at this hatching, I feel like, well, that's sloppy. I should probably slow down. So hopefully that hopefully this is helping to see a little bit more clearly. Um, this just feels too heavy. I feel like I'm missing the mark on this. Um, so let me try to take a take another stab at it. So I'm just pressing and lifting with the kneaded eraser. And so this mark, since it's the softer transition on this side, I'm actually pulling and lifting in towards me. And I think there are some other marks that run. You know, this is really a cross hatching. So running down this long dimension, getting a little bit heavier on the inside. And then here we see, again, that, uh, that approach to turning the edge by running lines that run parallel to the contour, kind of gradually lightening as you enter the center of the form. And then you're kind of finding your way through here. And here we have, yeah, he's really trying to find, you know, there are a lot of searching marks here. So what I mean by that is you can you can see that he's really trying to get a feel for um, you're trying to get a feel for that form and he's, he's he doesn't quite have a, a thorough understanding right of the first uh, right on the onset but he's discovering it as he goes All right, so actually, I think I'm gonna, that feels a little dark. Let me lighten it up now. That's more accurate. Um, yeah, we'll have, we'll have to have con continue, we'll have to continue the work here. We're not gonna, this area that I'm working on here is not gonna be finished um, at this point. We're gonna have to come back to it, I think. We'll, we'll keep coming back to it multiple times. All right, so let's continue on. Um, let's see. Uh, Marty Lake, would you please do a close-up of the face? Uh, I don't know if I... There. Uh, kind of locked in. That's about as close as I can get of what I've done on the face. Um, let me see if I can frame this up better. There we go. I'll punch in just a little bit. I'm gonna, I'm just gonna clean this up just a little. All right, because I really, and I'm gonna move on to this arm and then come into the the center a little bit. Um, but as I work on the arm, I'm gonna be kind of working on this whole area. So that's gonna include some of that torso. And so you can see that uh, what I was talking about, that turning edge here as we as he creates these hatch marks that run parallel to the contour. And he's finding that edge. Um, and now we see that 
and the my shoulder muscle come down here. The tricep kind of emerges from behind it. And then tricep comes in, and then there's another part of the arm that takes over the contour into that muscle on the elbow. Um, now as we as we come through here, I can see, you know, a bunch of cross hatching. There's a there's another pass that runs seems to run kind of vertically. And there's just this, you know, really he tucks that that arm into that armpit beautifully. Right up here, when I kind of hit that again, try to find that shoulder muscle a little bit more clearly. Um, Sorry, I see there's there's quite a bit happening in the chat. So if I've missed anything, you know, if I've missed a question that you would like me to address, please let me know. Feel free to type that in again. All right, now there's all of these subtle areas where it gets lighter and darker. As we, I'm going to move over here into this the crook of the elbow. Um, yeah, see kind of a light hatching. Here, kind of hatching here. And so my technique for hatch hatching is is generally to um, you know, here I'm using my wrist when it makes sense, but these diagonal ones, I rather than go like this, I'm locking my wrist and using my arm. Uh, and I don't know if it's as quite as precise as it could be. And so you really look how dark he gets in this right here in the crook of the arm. And what's interesting about that is that it's, it's basically darker than most of the areas along the contour. And that helps to, um, it helps to pull the center of the form and create that rounded quality. And then you can see that he's observing the bicep and as he's rendering that shadow, he's got these marks that kind of wrap around the form and there's a subtle um, muscle or tendon right in here that he's identifying the shadow of. And then I'm going to go even darker in the center of this mass here, the shadow. But like I said, I, I want to be I want to be thinking about this part as well, the, that bit of the torso, because that integration is really kind of important. So if you look at the folds here, again, again that contour, we have like this this layer of kind of muscle wrapping around along that kind of falls along the rib cage. We have this other one that kind of comes in here, and then this larger form. And everything gets kind of obscured and lost into this dark area. Not a lot of clarity in there. That's okay. Like, we don't need that level of clarity. But it's that intertwining, the, especially the way this part of that hip 
um, cuts in behind that bicep is really a critical thing. It's, it looks small, but that's what brings that shoulder, I mean, that elbow right in on top of the hip. So um, if we treat it like one continuous line here, we're going to be in trouble. If we treat it like an overlapping of the form, you know, even though it occupies basically the same space, it'll read completely differently. And you just get a sense as you follow along these lines is that he's, as he's, he's trying to find the contour by searching through the center of that form, making his way to that edge. And then when he finds that edge, he might be a little bit more precise with it. And you can see it really all of these searching marks here around that wrist so this is where we start to kind of observe his, um, his take on drawing hands. And we kind of talked a bit about earlier in the, uh, we, as we started the show was to, you know, observe that he's really giving the abdomen the center of tension. That's where he's refining it to the, the greatest degree. So that seems to be his, uh, his prime focus um, all right, so then here along this contour, what we're seeing is a continuation of this muscle that wraps up onto the, the elbow, where it comes down into the center of the form and the series of hatch marks. And as we come up here, then it kind of transitions into that contour line. Then that contour line gets picked up under, back behind that muscle. And there's this... Um, parallel hatching going on here to shade that part of the form. And I believe he does that first before he searches for the contour just by looking at the way that contour line here feels broken by the embossed lines of that parallel hatching. All right. Um, I would say, uh, Claudia, I want to read your comment here. I find it interesting how Michelangelo brought a greater value of shadow around the height in both the elbow pit and belly bottom. Um, I feel drawn to a visual triangle between those two in the armpit shade. That's a really good observation. That's really where I was, um, what I was observing too. And I'm going to have to come back in and darken this here along the inner part of this elbow. Um, isn't it, it's really wild. Like he just has um, such a keen sense of, of that understanding. Edges have to, to play such a key role. And I, do, I just find it really fascinating because the, um, you know, the fresco work you know, kind of has these harder lines just because of the nature of the way fresco works. You have to define certain areas because it, because it dries. You have to work in the wet plaster while it's wet. You know, you're adding pigment to that wet plaster. Once it's dry, your um, understanding is that you're really your only way of fixing it is to take that section out and try it again. Um, and so what I see in this drawing is that what is kind of dominant is his sculptural understanding of the form, not the two-dimensional understanding of the form that comes from his fresco work because he's so aware of how these forms turn in space. Um, and I think he worked with a limitation of a fresco, that two-dimensional quality, um, but his understanding of the form really is rooted in Sculpture. That's what I. That's my takeaway from these drawings here. All right. So we get down to the hands. You know, he's kind of shaded in this plane, so he's kind of observed a basic turn from light to shadow. And then within that, let's see where is he putting his emphasis. So right here, for example, he's 
using these to observe kind of the muscles, the, the knuckles there on this part of the hand and letting that thumb just be a suggestion. Um, and then he's capturing the pose, the bend in that finger, the gesture of it, not the specificity. And he's observing it as this sequence of, of kind of joining together the various knuckle joints. So something like that. Um, and, there, and there's still kind of an understanding of how forms overlap and interact with one another. So like this part, the, the, the pad of the thumb kind of continues into the center of the form here. The, um, you know, the, arm, the hand here has this plane that recedes away. Um, the, the, we have the knuckle here, I mean, the, the wrist here that kind of stands out in front of the knuckle. And then we get in just enough information where we don't really question it. And we, we see that down here as well in this, this hand. Kind of a quick expression of these marks. So here he's, you can see the way he's wrapping up around what he's observing is the placement of the knuckles here. And that seems to be the more critical element, you know, placing those knuckles properly to get that shape of the, the, the hand there. It's not a straight line. There's that curve to it. All right, I'm going to zoom back out try to capture the whole thing a little bit more, give myself a little bit more room to maneuver. Um, I'm gonna make a pass here again with the, that kind of, the hatching that runs parallel to the form, kind of miss that and there's some here. And then I think I need to kind of darken this and just affect the, the transition. So as you're, as you're going through, we, we can observe that transition from light into dark into that edge, but there's nuance to that. It's not a consistent, even spacing leading up to that edge. It's a little bit darker here. Um, it gets lighter in here. It doesn't get quite, a, quite as dark along this edge. Uh, and here we have um, you know, uh, it kind of continues a little bit of darkness down in the center of the form here, getting a little bit lighter over there. Um, all very subtle stuff, but important for kind of expressing that the musculature. All right. Phew. All right, Dita, we'll see you next week. Thank you for joining us. Um, so if you're joining us right now, what you're watching is Drawing Together with Artist Network. My name is Scott Meyer. Um, and if you are interested, at the top of the chat I, and in the description below, I have a link to my book where you'll, that you'll find on Amazon and Barnes & Noble. And that comes out in print soon, actually, hopefully, or in June. Um, Let's see, I'm going to, let me start to work on this area here. I'm gonna work my way down though. Also very subtle here. So what I'm, I think I need to establish the lights a little bit more again. So just picking up with the kneaded eraser in some areas. And I'm trying to observe kind of the muscles. So you can see like the, the chest muscles really feel like bands that are, that are blending together there. So I'm, I'm trying to lift off in a way that expresses those bands. Um, 
there is, you know, right under here, there's these, this little muscle that falls into shadow. Right under here, there's this one here as well. Um, so I'm not lifting the highlight there. I'm trying to suggest those muscular shapes through a darkening of the shadow in that area so that we maintain a sense of hierarchy where the light's stronger on the pectorals. Um, there's this, uh, you're so subtle that, you know, I, you don't really notice them at first. So again, it kind of goes back to what I was saying earlier about the difference between perception and awareness, right? You know, we're all capable of perceiving things, but awareness is really developed over time. And we, to, when we tell our brains that something is important, um, and all of a sudden these things that we, that were right in front of us, you know, kind of. We just become aware of them more. Um, and so I, that's something that's happening for me is, you know, becoming aware of the subtlety that's so crucial for expressing the, the structure on the rib cage that's being kind of obscured by the, um, the muscles there. Um, if you are new and you want to draw along, the link to the image is in the description below. All right, so now what we're seeing is a general kind of a triangular shape here. And then this muscle here, kind of there's this diagonal pull here. And this kind of goes back to what I was saying earlier about, you know, if you have an anatomical understanding of, of what's happening, it can be really helpful. Absent of that, though, you can ask yourself a set of, of questions and make a set of decisions that you can do with any drawing. So ultimately what drawing is about is making a set of decisions. And, you know, what you can look at is what is the shape, what's the direction, where is it placed, and and then go from there. And then the, through the drawing process, you become more aware of anatomy. You think about that's how, you know, we developed an understanding of all this anatomy is through a lot of, a lot of artists paying close attention and saying, wow, look at that little bump. What does that do? That must connect to this other little bump and that might connect to this bone. And then you gradually piece that together and then you start cutting people open and checking against it. Um, let's see. Yeah, so this is, yeah, this is an intense drawing, Monique. <laughs> I'm glad you said that. I, I and this was that was a surprise. I guess that's what happens when you do master copies. Is that, I you know I saw all right. This is a study, right? It's something that we can manage. And then you get into it, and you're like, wow, this is why Michelangelo ha is still relevant. However, many six hundred years later, right? So, um, and. You know, we it's it's that that level of kind of mastery and confidence that you know we have people that that have this same level of skill and mastery today, um, but there's something to you know about you know developing that at the time that he was alive. You know, and you don't have YouTube and Instagram and all these things that point out you know what's possible. All right, so I'm going to come back over to here. I just I try not to get hung up on one area too long. Got to keep moving around. I'd rather step away from an area and then come back to it. Um, and what can be helpful at, as we're working in these areas is you know we see these dark shapes and they don't have a clearly defined edge. If you squint your eyes, you might be able to see a more distinct shape, but really pay attention to the transition in the values. Um, you know, it's very, very soft. And ask yourself if your transitions are too harsh. If they're too harsh, you can soften with your finger. Um, you can kind of wipe it down, and then 
use a kneaded eraser to pull out a light on this kind of the center of the highlight form. Or, and you can go in and darken the darker part of the shadow. So you keep working that area, just being delicate with it. Uh, Saman is asking about the materials. You know, I, yeah, I don't believe they worked with pencils or graphite that was encased in wood the way we have in pencils. Um, and the, the pen would have been a, like a, a quill pen or a metal, metal tip pen that you would have dipped into a, a well or used a brush like uh, Rembrandt used a lot of a lot of sketching with a brush and pen a brush and ink I mean there's a scratch in the paper that just kind of filled in with graphite but I imagine the quality of the graphite I don't know as if it's really changed a whole lot you know it's there, it's a relatively simple technology in that, you know, graphite is, you know, a material that gets extracted from the earth. You know, there are known graphite mines. There's not a ton of them. Um, and that graphite gets grounded into a powder mixed with some sort of binder, like a clay-like binder. Um, and the ratio between that binder and the powder graphite controls how dark and hard you know, how dark and soft or hard and light the graphite is. And so I, imag I would imagine that that technology existed then, but I don't know for sure. Any art historians there or fast Googlers might be able to address that. So you see a very subtle um, understanding of the ribs here, these slight um, darkening of the, the shadows in that rib area. Uh, if you're having trouble seeing those, um, what you might practice doing is looking at your values, observing your values indirectly. We actually can be more precise with our observations of color and value when we look indirectly or just offset from our focus, the area that we're targeting. Uh, so if for example, if I'm looking at this area here and I'm trying to see, you know, what that value shape looks like, if you look just to the right or the left of it, but put your awareness on this, you might find that it's actually a more precise interpretation of that value. Our center of vision is really primed for uh, texture and detail, often at the expense of value relationships. It tends to heighten that value. It's like running through a sharpening filter in Photoshop or something. Um, and so try looking offset at it. Um, I, I noticed that when looking at the moon, for example, on a, a full moon at, dark, at night, um, I want to see with my naked eye all the, the craters and the details there. And it is really difficult at night to look straight at the moon and see those things. It just gets flooded with the light. Um, but if you look just to the left or the right of the moon, um, all of a sudden that detail kind of comes out and you can see it a little bit more clearly. And that can often happen in a drawing as well. And so especially in these areas here, try looking here, but put your awareness on this and you might see things. Squint your eyes. Um, that can help as well. Just kind of modulate your vision a little bit to see um, if you notice anything more substantive. Um, Oh, Gail, I searched it and it looks like graphite was first discovered and used in the mid uh, to late 1700s and they originally thought it was lead. Oh, that's right. Yeah, they, so this actually might be a lead drawing or something that, that Michelangelo was uh, using. Curious. All right, so now there's, there's this noticeable crease here that's really important. You want to get the angle of it right. It's got very soft edges. And then if you can continue that line up, what you see is a subtle bend or there's this kind of muscle here. So that, that fold, that bend is impacted by the rib cage and then the muscles around that. 
rib cages are hard, so you put a bend in it and you can see a distinct crease. That's what we're seeing here. Um, but then there's this muscle that kind of wraps around here that uh, also seems to come into play. So I'm doing, I'm doing a lot of work with the side of the pencil here, and that's actually going to serve me because it's sharpening the point. Actually, I think this... This is really tricky here. I think I, I think I might have gotten some of these lines confused. And you think of, if you, when you look at that line, it's not a sharp, clear line. It's really broken up and diffused at the end. Um, and then you see this roll here between this next line where the stomach really becomes more apparent. So what you're seeing is that transition from rib cage, there's then into the softness of the abdomen. Here we're getting there. Oh, it's three o'clock. Holy smokes. I'm gonna keep going if that's okay <laughs> I'm having too much fun with this. I usually stop at about two hours But I feel like this needs a little bit more time. So if you're if you're up for it, I'm gonna to stay Working on this um, And if you're just joining us again, this is drawing together with artist network. My name's Scott Meyer and we draw every Wednesday at 3 p.m. Eastern because It's good for us um, It's good for our artistic practice. It's good for our spirits. We like to challenge ourselves so that we develop particular skills. We give ourselves challenges each week. So the challenge we have here is doing the study of a of a uh, drawing here by Michelangelo. And I named this, you know, as part of the Art of the Steel um, uh, series of master copies. And it's kind of a tongue-in-cheek way of you know, kind of addressing the fact that we're we're just copying somebody else's work, um, but it's such a key factor in developing um, artistic skill. It's something that has really been tested throughout history as effective. Um, but the goal here isn't to just create a duplicate. The goal is to try to analyze the marks and see if we can understand Michelangelo a little bit better by thinking through what might be behind the marks that we're seeing. Um, both from a kind of strategic point of view as well as a uh, kind of a technical um, point of view where, um, you, know, you know, what skills is he, what te techniques is he using, what's the process, also where is his mind at, why is he choosing to refine one area over another. You look down in here and you can really see these marks that wrap around the form. That's such a key thing, um, these cross-contour mark marks that, that express the, the substance of that form so beautifully. Uh, as we come down here, you can really see how he's a little indecisive about that, that placement of the the hip, you know, he, he tried it out a little bit lower, it looks like. Uh, I say indecisive, that's not really, that's not really what I think is happening. So I need to retract that. Um, he's making a, a, a decisive decision to move that hip. So he's exploring that a little bit. And by bringing the hip over just slightly, it just enhances that slump. Um, I had, you know, heard that Rodin would, um, you know, if you, if you look at, say, a figure of Rodin walking that, you know, what you're seeing isn't a figure frozen in space. If you're, what he's done to create that figure is he's, he's analyzed an entire sequence of somebody walking and he's grabbed the position of the arm from one stage and another arm from a different, slightly different stage and the, the leg from a slightly different stage. And so, 
it it feels like it has more life to it. There's movement to it. And I almost feel like that's kind of what he's thinking here is like what would happen over time maybe. Um, you know, I don't think the hips would – maybe they would shift over there in that direction or, you know, maybe bring that shoulder forward. But I kind of get that sense of um, making those adjustments to really enhance the the feeling of movement. There's a nice value wash over this whole abdomen, that whole abdominal area. And now, yeah, you get in that belly button where it gets really dark. It gets dark up in here. And as I look at those dark areas, I'm being careful to kind of feather out those lines if we draw a distinct line, what that tells the viewer is that's the edge of an object, and that's not what we're seeing. We're seeing forms within it. Um, all right. So yeah, the, just doing this copy of a of a Michelangelo is a great way to better understand anatomy without having to remember all those terms. <laughs> And the more you do a drawing like this, you know, the, it does inform your mental image of a figure that can be helpful if your goal is to, um, you know, express something more from your imagination. So the more figure drawing, the better if you're if you're looking to invent characters. Uh, I know in you know in some schools that teach. Um, either cartooning or graphic novels. Uh, it's a ton of figure drawing work. I believe they call that sequential illustration. It's the last time I looked into it, that seemed to be the term. And you can really feel like he's he's feeling out the abdomen here. So you got to bring this over a little bit more and place it properly. And so uh, the key thing here is to follow the right in here. You know, if you were standing up, we'd probably see a, a well-defined six-pack. That center of that six-pack is really slanted at this angle here, where we're, we're connecting the dots between these dark forms, and I can't quite rotate my paper, but I want to bring in some cross, you know, kind of dimensional hatching here, changing up the direction of the marks in there. Um, you see this other kind of six-pack form right in here, where it gets a little bit darker. And my technique is just to go back and forth, back and forth, varying the length of my mark, so kind of tighter in the center of that darker shadow, making a pass with wider, lighter marks. And then we see the center of that abdomen. It's like he really clearly defines that there. And so one of the things that I've had to overcome in my in my years of drawing is that feeling like I, I have to overstate my observations. You know, I'll, make, I'll make an observation of something subtle and in my desire to really show that off because I'm excited about it, I tend to overstate it. And so I've been, I feel like my years drawing has been largely an exercise in becoming more increasingly subtle and letting discoveries happen on the page
you know, generally we're really good at seeing subtle variations in value. Um, and, be, and again, it goes back to perception versus awareness. Once we become aware of something, we tend to exaggerate it. Um, I need to, right now I see dark spot, and then right in here there's, um, one, one of the things that might be helpful, you know, as, I, as I, you know, I'm observing this dark spot here, it's easier for me to see with a smaller thumbnail than the larger image I have up here on the left. And so you might try, um, you might try having a few different versions of the reference open and see where that, see what that does for you. I do, I do want to kind of darken this whole shadow area. Right in here too. So again, some of the kind of dimensional hatching following the, the contour of that section. I apologize, I haven't read the, the comments in a while, so I hope there's no lingering questions here. Um, Cynthia, I, I meant to shout out. I'm glad to see you back. Hope you're doing well. Sounds like you have transitioned to a new place. So I hope that went well. Um, all right, so as we, we're kind of nearing the end now, because the rest I can kind of be a little less precise with. So look at these marks here along the leg that really kind of wrap up along, along that, that leg. And he has this awareness of how the leg kind of continues on underneath. I need to lighten that up. Um, there's a, a little suggestion of the cloth. And I like I like using this overhand grip for these for this mark these marks. It just gives me a greater range of movement than versus a tripod grip. And you get a sense of how quick these marks are here. But he's still aware of the overlapping form as you follow along the contour. He's aware of the way the form might originate in the center of mass and then find its way to the contour and influence the contour marks that you're making. And then there's this, just this hatching here that I'm observing. So there's a lot of little things that I haven't really called out. It's hard to talk and focus on that at the same time. But uh, hopefully this has been helpful to you. I know this, is, this was a lot of fun for me. I feel like it was a really big learning opportunity to do this master copy. If you missed the earlier ones where I did with Degas, um, you might check that out. Um, I feel like, yeah, again, I don't know as if this really has the quality of Michelangelo, um, but I feel like there's still so much that I was able to learn. I think what I want to do now is just take a, this is too distinct here, just take a kneaded eraser to, to the highlighted areas to reinforce the form. shoulder here, he really pulls out that highlight. Soften that a little bit. Kind of refine some of this a bit. Um, and then, you know, this is this my second attempt because I did a preparatory drawing I do feel like this is a stronger 
um, stronger result. So if you're thinking, you know, that yours might, you know, be less optimal for what you prefer to your drawing to be, or you feel like you could learn more from it, you know, take a few attempts at this. I think that's a, you know, you take you'll you know learn so much from your initial attempt that you can apply to another one. Um, and and remember too that the if you're intimidated at all, this you don't have to show your work to anybody. You know, this is this can be just for you. Um, you know, this is that's why we're we we do this is because it it helps us build a healthy practice um, that you know that we can continue on with. So it helps us with our painting. It helps us with our drawing. It helps us with our at least my work day. I don't know what I, every Wednesday. I I don't know how I make it till Wednesday or <laughs> a week between. I just feel like I need more drawing. Um, just for my sanity. So, all right. Um, if you're new, I want to thank you for joining us. This is episode, what, 135. So there's a lot of other episodes. You can join, you can jump in at any subject you want. Um, we try to cover a range of subjects from master copies, to landscapes, still lifes, portraits. We'll be doing a still life next week, um, a portrait following that. I think a landscape. Uh, next month, we'll, our Art of the Steel will be a Van Gogh drawing. Um, I always welcome uh, comments, thoughts. So, you know, you'll find my contact information in the description below. Be sure to like the video and, and hit notifications so you're notified of the next live event. So I'll be posting the next live event sometime this week. So stay up to date on that. Check out artistnetwork.com. You'll find a link to the page where you can share your drawing if you've been following along. And I, so I'd love to see your drawings. It's a very welcoming environment. I love seeing everybody's work and it seems to be continually growing. So I hope you um, are willing to share your work with the community here. Um, uh, I would like, and I love to hear from everybody. If you have any ideas for topics that you might want to uh, try, tackle, I try to put that in the, in the, the brainstorming documents for ideas. And then I try to find a good reference image that will work for us. So um, this has been a blast. Everybody, thank you and have a fantastic day.